Hello, everybody. Uh, this is your host, Aram Mokamouf, and you're listening to the Product Innovation Show. Every week, my guests share their stories and wisdom on how to ship a great product. Today, I'm here with Peter uh, Lepian. Did I say that right? I've, I've heard much worse. I've heard much worse. If you <laughs> want it in Italian, I can pronounce it that way, but that'll work. Tell me what it is in Italian. Lepiane. But we're, we'll go with Lepiani. Lepiani is about as anglicized as, as it can get. <laughs> okay. So Peter, um, quick background on Peter, he's a leadership and change coach who has been ad advising large enterprises as a management consultant through venture capital, startup mentoring, and professional coaching for decades. He's a skilled facilitator and trainer who has been at the front of rooms of as big as 200 people. Peter, welcome to the show. It's, uh, it's fantastic having you here with us today. Hey, thanks very much, Aram. This is, uh, is going to be good fun. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. First question I have... Um, so from what I know, you have facilitated and, you know, been in groups of up to 200 people uh, in, in your sessions. I got to ask, how do you keep 200 people engaged and not, you know, being on their phone and not being distracted? What? People, people do that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can only kind of speak for me. I, I don't I don't. I think it's impossible to keep 200 people, you know, 100% engaged and, you know, not on one of these things for however long, even if it's 15 minutes. Uh, it's unrealistic to think that you can keep uh, uh, that many people completely riveted on, on what you're saying, every single one of them. So, I mean, what I try to do to set up a kind of container so that that happens more often than not is I tend to invite the participants into a bit of a designed alliance. And typically, um, you know, those people are, are, are there voluntarily. Sometimes they're not. So this might, you got to tailor this depending on, on, on who your audience is and, and why they're there. But look, I mean, if, if that, if being on your phone is more important than listening to what I've got to say or what we've got to do, hey, by all means, that, that's fantastic go and deal with what you got to do on your phone. But while we're here, uh, what I invite them to do is if they decide to remain, that they, um, that they do commit to, to full attention as much as they can. Um, and, you know, I find that kind of providing that out um, and certainly people have, people have walked out at that point in time and that's fine. I just invited them to do that. So that's, that's totally, totally fine. And I think that providing that choice and, and making people, at choice is what helps. I, I've seen some things like you got to leave your phone at the door <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Done before. What, what, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that. I mean, to some extent, maybe, you know, the thought that might cross my mind if I was going into a session like that is, you know, is this really going to be more important than maybe, you know, a phone call that comes in that says one of my kids is hurt? Like, nah, I don't know. I, it, I don't know. I, I'm not in love with that. Uh, so, I mean, look, if you're the type of person who is going to be, you know, you're going to be super, uh, uh, you know, concerned about your kid getting hurt, you know, they might be doing something on that particular day or you have an elderly parent or whatever in the world your life situation is, by all means, you know, opt out. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Um, so in in your recent like years, or I think going back for some time, you've been uh, involved in a lot of change management at various companies. Um, and I, I believe you said that uh, this, uh, the success of any company really boils down to how, how good they are at change. Um, I think some companies are good at it. Some companies are still lackluster. You know, this is a skill set. Um, can you give us a high level perspective in terms of how change management works? And I believe you're also writing a series of short stories around this topic. So maybe you could talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So a few, few different things in there. If I miss anything, then you tell me and, and, and I'll, uh, I'll make sure I address it. So given that my short term memory is, is the best thing that works in my brain, uh, short stories. Um, so yes, I'm writing a set of short stories cause you know, as a first time author, uh, and they're all fiction. So, uh, you know, I should make things hard on myself by writing fiction and creating characters and, and fictional situations. So the idea is um, uh, 10, about 10 short stories, all about different situations in the corporate world. You know, some some sort of factual, but all made up. 
um, about change and about leadership and change and about how hard it is to be a good leader in change and what happens if you're not. Uh, all told, um, you know, hopefully humorously and hopefully enter, you know, entertainingly. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's meant to be a bunch of stories that hopefully make you laugh and make you think. And uh, at the end of the day, if, if that, you know, if, if, if you think, hey, this guy might be able to help me navigate change better, well, then it, they'll tell you where to find me. Awesome. And so, oh, what there were is, more questions. Yeah, there were more questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, High level perspective, what is change management and how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe, and maybe addressing this question more like what, what, what is, what isn't change management or what is, what is change without change management for that matter? So I think this happens a lot, even, you know, even in the corporate world with lots of change management people running around. So there's this idea that we want to go from state A, from something that's status quo, something that's comfortable, something that's known, and we want to go to state B. Now, there are typically good reasons for this, strategic reasons for this. So what I find is we tend to believe that that's a straight path and, and it's just, oh, well, whatever, we'll just start here. And then, you know, we think, we internally think, not the people who are going to change think that we can just go here and then they'll go here, then they'll go here, then they'll go here and poof, we'll all be changed and we'll be in this new state and it'll just run that way forever. And I don't know about you, but humans don't work that way. Uh, I don't know any humans that work that way. Maybe, you know, more the more robotic of the people I know, but like the vast majority of, of teams I've been with and organizations I've been in, the people just don't work that way. It's you know I think of change as a product almost. So just kind of speaking speaking to the audience here, you know, as a product person, um, you know, I, I, I would like to think that you would be uncertain if it was a new idea for a product. You'd be uncertain about whether your product was desirable or not with its target customer. Change is the exact same thing. You just don't know until that change starts meeting the humans. And when it starts meeting the humans, you learn a whole bunch of stuff that you not in a million years when you were like, oh, it's going to start here, you know, then there, then there. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Like you can go, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, but please don't spend a lot of time on it and please get ready for it to change. Okay. Um, and you've been doing this for a while now. So had there been times that you realized in certain organizations that culturally mindset, I don't know, personality wise of like the team, they're just not set up for change at all. And so what are those like indicators that people should watch out for? Yeah, that's, uh, that is, uh, I think it can rear its head in, in maybe some different ways, but I, I find the way that I find out that they're not really set up, it's a, definitely a mindset thing. And it really, um, again, I'm going to come back to, to product and like product people tend to, for the most part, not everybody, there's some product people out there who are like, no, 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 my product is amazing. The idea is amazing. It's going to go out there and it's going to succeed. Therefore, I'm going to go spend a whole bunch of money on a logo and a company name and marketing and all this stuff. And I'm going to big bang it and it's just going to work. Again, it's how a lot of people in the corporate world think about change, unfortunately. So what I find is an indicator that that um, that change is going to be hard for you. And when I say that, I mean, you're going to spend a whole bunch of money up front planning the living daylights out of your change. Then you're going to launch it and then it's not going to work the way you thought it was going to work. And you got to go backwards a lot. So and, and the bets that you're making are big. You're putting big effort into this stuff. So the companies where I think th 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 where, where I seem to find that that happens more often than not, like big bet, waste a lot of money, go back to the start, or at least close enough to the start, are ones where the expectation is when you do something, you do it right the first time. Like there is no such thing. What is this experimentation thing? Like, don't I pay you to know? Like, I don't pay you to guess. I pay you to know. So if I'm paying you to know, then there is no chance of ever being wrong. So just plan the whole thing out and just do it because that's what I pay you for. And if you start to see those types of things, it's going to be tough sledding. It's, uh, it's, 
very closely parallel to our own world of product development. Um, people pay us to figure this out or to know what we're doing. But at the end of the day, each product, each build, each journey is always different. And so um, there's always learnings and experimentation that we constantly do and go through all the time. Um, and you're right. It's hard to position in a way that, hey, we don't have all the answers. We don't know everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, in, in those organizations that you did work <laughs> successfully yeah. in, um, how did you help them set them up for change? Um, yeah. Frameworks, methodologies, you know, what are, what's like a good approach that you've seen, uh, led to a successful, um, change management? Yeah, I, I mean, I got to throw huge uh, props and kudos at a colleague of mine uh, by the name of Jason Little uh, out, of, out of Toronto, uh, who uh, wrote a book called Lean Change Management. And if you're a product person, you're going to recognize a lot of stuff in there because it all it's lean startup. It's just lean startup applied to change, not just there's other stuff in there, but it's very much a lean startup approach to change. This is what works. Um, not just for me, and maybe more so for me, because I am a lean startup guy at, at, at the core of who I am. Um, but it it takes the ideas of lean startup and 100% applies it to change. It starts, you know, it's not saying start with an MVP, but it's not exactly not saying that either. Uh, it's basically really... Um, selling out to an experimental, an experimenter's mindset. So... Um, start wherever you want to start. You know, that might be Adcar, it might be McKinsey's model, it might be Cotter. There's lots of different change models, Switch, lots of different good change models out there. And they, you know, it, it, like Adcar, it's A, then D, then K, then A, then R. Like it's in a line and it goes from one to the other. It's not the DAC, whatever in the world it would be backwards or some other. No, it's like this, then that, then that, then that, then that. And what I have done with lean change management whether Jason want, wanted people to work this way or not. I mean, I think he's, you know, he, he understands that there are people using lean change management in all sorts of different ways is it's really a, a, an experimenter's mindset framework on top of could be on top of some other change management model. I'm working with a client right now. That's exactly what I'm doing is I'm putting together um, step-by-step -step templates in, in, in Miro um, that basically take ADCAR and put lean change management on top of it so that you're basically doing ADCAR tactics, but you're doing them as an experiment. You're not saying this leadership communication thing is going to work, so we're just going to dedicate a whole bunch of people to it, do a bunch of work, and then it's just going to work. You're, you're phrasing it as an experiment, like an if-then statement. If we do this thing, then this is going to happen. We'll know it's happened when this evidence shows up within this time frame. That's an experiment. And that's what lean change management takes. It, it really, to me, transforms a very static, um, linear change model into something that's kind of living, breathing, uh, and adaptable. Okay. I, uh, I like the whole if, if then kind of statement approach, <laughs> because then you could actually test yeah. everything in like, like unit testing sort of equivalent, um, one thing at a time. Uh, interesting. Um, in your experience, what what can company leaders or you know the successful ones who are who get it, they appreciate the value. What did, what have you seen they do early on in their companies to get that change muscle or that change mindset really going uh, for their team or their company? Yeah, uh, I think there's probably a couple of things that 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 stick out for me. One is, uh, is that mindset, that same mindset that I just spoke of, excuse me. And it's, can you, uh, surrender to the uncertainty of the world? Like we're not getting more certain. It feels like as time goes on, it feels like things are getting kind of less predictable than they used to be. I don't know the rate of change of that. There are, you know, smarter people who've probably done research on this. But it feels like that pace is increasing. So the companies that strike me that that they're that they're going to be ready for this world more. Think of 
learning as a currency, like almost an internal organizational currency? Like how much learning did you get by doing that as opposed to what was the ROI? Look, I'm, don't get me wrong. Of course, ROI. But, you know, to me, learning is the precursor to ROI, not let's go ROI, but like how much learning? So you got to be in the right stage for it to, to be like, how much learning did you get? You can't be an idiot about it and be like, no, 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 this is supposed to be like making a bunch of money because we already did our learning. No, 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 that, that doesn't make any sense. I'm absolutely not saying that. But I think that's one of the things is like understanding that learning is a very important currency in, in kind of how, how we're um, in, in kind of the times we're living in. It's, it's, it's more steady state change than it's steady state status quo. So kind of, you know, putting more and more and more into the engines of growth that already exist for you, for sure, got to do it, right? Got to keep the lights on. But there should be something where you're kind of looking into the world of uncertainty and kind of trying to prepare for that in more experimental ways, because you don't know what that is unless you got the crystal ball that I've been looking for my whole life. So that's one thing. The second thing I think is from a leadership perspective, really being willing to go first and 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 really being authentic and 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 honest and vulnerable change sucks it's hard it's hard on most people even people who are like no 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 i love change okay then you put them in change and you find out that actually you know that they're, they're not i mean i even say that myself and then i actually get there and it's like that's that was more uncomfortable than that than i thought it was and i think if the the leader can basically go, look, hey, I'm not going to ask you to do anything until I do it myself. And when I do it, I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to tell you how much it hurt. And I'm, so then you feel okay about it and it's okay for you to go next and it's okay for you to fail and, and, and be frustrated and, and not get your job done right. That's okay. There's a, a, a an interesting anecdote that I that I heard. I don't know if this is a joke or not, but I uh, call it IBM. I don't know if it was. So uh, this like <laughs> it could be yeah. senior vice president goes into the boss's office and uh, sits down and the senior vice president has just made a multimillion dollar uh, mistake. Uh, the uh, the the boss says, do you know why you're here? Senior executive says, uh, I'm here for you to fire me. Boss says, are you insane? I just invested multi millions of dollars in you. I'm not firing you. See, that's a good mindset. Right. Yeah, I'm, I, I definitely um, can relate to the whole learning versus the ROI. Um, I think the only way people can learn and improve is just through failing and, and in learning about why that happened. Um, and then the ROI really starts to kick in, I think, once there's been enough learning so that we know what we need to report on or, or we know what we need to actually track against from an ROI standpoint. So I 100% agree with you uh, on that. Yeah. And um, yep. it's a challenge, right? I think working with people who can understand that is, uh, is a tough one, which leads me to my next question, yep. which is um, I've worked with enough clients and enough companies in general that there is always, uh, depending on the setting or depending on the size of the company, there's a lot of MBAs <laughs> <laughs> running around in that world uh, or making decisions uh, trying to predict the future uh, for those yeah. businesses. And I think there's always a time and place for them. Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what you could talk about in terms of what your thoughts are on, on having them being, or they're having too many of them thinking about your business and thinking about uh, how they can predict your future. Yeah, I mean, uh, MBA or, or not, if you think you can predict the future, I'd like to see you prove it. So that's that's cool. And if you can, you're welcome on my team any day. Um, so look like, yeah, I mean, I think MBA schools are changing. I don't have one myself, so maybe this is just my own envy coming out. Um, but uh, you know, have been associated with with MBA schools and business schools. I've I've taught entrepreneurship at one um, just outside of Toronto, um, and I think they're trying to change their curriculum. So look, there's uh, I th I think the way that 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 MBA programs seem to work and and kind of what I've seen out of them, but just 
you know, a, a whole cadre of, of, of folks who can, who have MBAs maybe, and it's wider than that, right? It's not just MBAs, people who think they can predict the future. You don't necessarily need an MBA to think you can do that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that that's a problem to kind of loop all the way back to kind of our, our, the earlier part of our conversation, because it's going to then make you think that you can linearly plan something because you know how it's going to end up. You know the end point. Well, yeah, I mean, for sure, right? If you know the end point, like, I don't know, shoveling a driveway or something like that. Like, I know the end point. It's pretty simple. Like, I can go Google, you know, a, a snow blowing technique for my driveway. You can tell them in Canada. Um, and... I mean, it's, it's certain it's, I mean, I might hit a rock and my kid might've, you know, put a toy in the driveway that I didn't find, but whatever, I can kind of get around that, but it's a pretty certain thing. I can, you know, follow the steps and I'll get there. But the stuff that we're talking about, you know, what, what product change, like it's just that the, the, there are humans involved and humans are not predictable. And the minute that you think they are, I'd like to think you're going to get bit either sooner or later. That's true. Um, I do really like the point about uh, that when you try to predict the future and you have, you know, a lot of the MBAs telling you what you should do, that's a very waterfall approach, just in general, from yeah. the management, from the product perspective. Uh, and I've seen that at work with companies where we were totally focused on this MBAs uh, or that whole consulting team's kind of direction. And they kind of planned it out for us, but they never actually went and tested anything. They never went and spoke to anybody. Um, and I, you know, I think they don't teach desirability. Um, mm. And so I want to kind of talk about that for a sec. Um, there's this framework called desirability, viability, feasibility. Um, and um, a lot of companies, you know, apply parts of it, but they typically mm. don't really put enough time around the desirability component. Is this wanted? Is this desirable? Did I speak to people who would want to to use this product or whatever it is? Um, I wanted to ask you what what have you seen about orgs that do product discovery well versus those that are awful at it? And like some of like the yeah, examples maybe you could share. Yeah, I, I'm. I was running. <clears throat> I was running a workshop for a bank, and uh, so this is going to be a. Um, a done poorly exam. Well, not, I mean, not necessarily. This is a bit of it, and then it, it ends. It ends well. <laughs> um, so here I am talking about you know that that model showed up that you know the Venn diagram that we've all seen with the three circles in it and where they intersect and people usually put innovation in the middle of it, which is fine. Um, so you know certainly that was on one of my slides, um, and we went through a full on mostly lean startup, but a little bit of design thinking workshop. Um, again, this is a bunch of credit card people in a bank. Um, I get to the end, uh, we've got, you know, basically an MVP sort of concept, just call it a unique value proposition that, that we're going to go, um, that we're going to go sanity test. And I said, okay, well, good news. Uh, they're banking customers all over the place, down on the street, down there, like everywhere. Everyone's probably got a credit card down there. Most people. So good news, you've got like every possible person down there that you just go walk up to, you can ask them about a credit card and ask them about this unique value proposition. And they froze. They were like glued to their seats. I'm like, no, 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 when I said that, I meant like now, not, not next week, not when you get more comfortable, not someone else doing it, not a focus group where you feed them pizza and, and pop, like no, uh, like now and you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, we had to talk about it. Like it was, it was this this very uncomfortable feeling for them. And I said, "Look, I'll, I'll like I'll go, I'll go with you. Like you can watch me do it first. And that, and that that seemed to kind of break the ice a little bit. And then we finally kind of went out, and they they loved it at the end of the day. Absolutely loved it. Like, oh my god, I never in a million years did I think that. Well, yeah, go figure. You talk to the people who actually use credit cards as opposed to you because you know everything about credit cards and like how you use your points and when you would use them and this and that. No one knows that stuff. Like you, you make the credit card. That doesn't mean that you know it like a customer. So that was one of them. The other one was an insurance company and uh, I had worked with them doing uh, lean startup workshops. So they were already kind of primed. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and, and they had it kind of in their DNA. They're, they're you know, as cool as an insurance company can get, they're it. Um, so they came to me and said, help us do customer interviews for this new product that we want to put out on the market. And um, I mean, so that was cool. Like the ask was cool. But what ended up happening, it's almost like I'm going in reverse with these two stories. What ended up happening is I wanted to show them how to do customer interviewing and to kind of really feel that desirability from from your point or lack thereof, just learning, period. Um, but they, the more we went through interviews, the more people started falling away and backing away and backing away, and they just weren't comfortable talking to real customers. So that was that was unfortunate. I think they missed out on a big learning opportunity. And, and why do you think they got uncomfortable? Like, are they like they just hmm. not know how to do it? Should somebody else have done this and given them the information, or should they have just you know figured out a way? to do this themselves through training or education or whatever. Yeah, it's, I, I think you, you hit on it. These large orgs, are, it's like a muscle that they've developed. They're like, look, when I need to learn something about a customer, I've got people that do that. Like there's mm-hmm. somebody who runs a focus group for like 10 grand and then they're going to give me the analysis. It'll be in a report and then that's really all I need because that's all I've ever gotten before. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's like someone else in there. I, I guess it's just... Um, uh, I think it's a fear of saying something wrong and like damaging brand and damaging your own reputation. Um, you know, I, I'm, it's easy. I can get fired pretty easily as a consultant and, you know, that happens all the time. It's all good, right? I mean, that's one of the privileges you get. Um, so it's easy to put me in the line of fire and, uh, and, 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 you know, quote unquote fail. Uh, you know, I like to call it learn. Uh, but if you know you're an employee and you've got a career to worry about and you know i don't know maybe you can't say some of these things maybe you can ask those questions yeah no it's 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 a tricky one um and i just think it's like the easiest thing that can be uh done just to make sure you know you're doing the right thing and so all the successful companies that i've spoken to today on the show like gong um, Clearco and many others, their whole uh, thought process is they're always speaking to their customers all the time. Yep. And uh, it's low hanging fruit, man. It's just Super, so, I agree it's with you. Low hanging fruit, it's just there. You already have these clients. Why not go speak to them? Yep. I just don't get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it either. Um, you know, I think, again, it comes back to leadership uh, for me. Um, and it comes back to. Uh, you know, fostering culture is a trite word, but fostering behaviors that uh, allow people to take chances and know that they're going to be safe doing it. Like, um, you know, you can say it till you're blue in the face as a leader. Like, no, 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 you're sad. Like, I mean, if you're worried about doing something stupid, don't worry, I got your back. But if you see evidence of that leader doing something with somebody else that they don't have their back, it doesn't matter what they say. You're, you're done. You're, you got to be careful as a leader in, in fostering these mindsets. Mm-hmm. So your, your eyes are on you all the time. And, and you going back to what you said earlier that um, you got to lead by change. So um, leaders have to be the first ones to put this kind of mindset thinking into place. Um, yeah. I mean, any kind of things you could recommend that you could share in terms of how to go about doing that? Like, are there trainings they should do coaching they should take i don't know hmm. how how can yeah give them the tools and ammunition to feel comfortable to making this type of change yeah like i think it's a simon sinek quote leaders eat last um you know in this particular case leaders change first um and uh <clears throat> i mean so let's pretend that you're a leader who has never changed first and you're like Hey, whatever, like it's that's the they change. Like I need to see the results of the change is a very common thing to think, you know, I can outsource the change. I'm going to bring in a, you know, a bunch of consultants and they're going to make the change happen. Um, All these things don't last like they might work 
in the short term, but they don't last. And, and you've seen it too. So like, let's pretend that I'm, I'm one of those people. <laughs> I'd like to think that repeated failures at, you know, and grand failures, because these are going to be big <laughs> at the end of the day. And if you're around for them, because sometimes these senior leaders aren't right, they've got like, it's like political terms. Um, you know, they've got like three, four years and then poof, they're, you know, they're gone. And then, you know, the, the, the next person has to, has to clean up the mess. You know, not always the case in, in middle management for sure, even like upper middle management. But, you know, I, I think the only thing that it, you know, that seems to teach us as humans is failure. You said it yourself. So, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I think you just got to fail enough or bad enough one time, you know, bad, a bunch of times or, you know, bad enough one time. And then you finally kind of surrender to the fact that there's another way to get this done. I mean, I think the only other way would be to have someone super influential in your life, uh, you know, some kind of mentor, um, go, maybe go through the same thing for it to have a really, really big impact on you. Or maybe this mentor has got like such influence on you that that they are able to kind of convince you into a different mindset. It, it's tough. It's tough to, to get people into different mindsets. Uh, I have a question. Um, like you, uh, we get hired as consultants to go and figure things out. Um, I feel like in the last decade or so, I've seen some change happening where companies are becoming less and less kind of reliant on consultants sometimes and bringing more things in house to do it. Mm. Um, I think, you know, why do they do it? It could be cost factors. It could be having that knowledge and IP in house. Um, what would you say is a, the right time and place? Uh, because mm. you kind of touched upon this earlier that, um, you know, th people come and go, but the, you know, uh, companies like us or people like us come in, they give some report and then, you know, we move on to the next thing. And then, you know, sometimes nothing happens with that. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious to ask, like, when is the right time and place to, um, figure this out yourself in, 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 in house? Mm -hmm. And when is the right time to bring in a consultant like us or, or you to do a specific thing? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to th look if you've got people who've been there, done that in your in your organization, then go for it. Right. I mean, you don't you don't need me, um, you know, if you've actually got those people um, and they've been through the wars, like truly through the wars, you know, maybe not just once and failing at it, too. Like you don't want someone who's just, you know, been like, oh, yeah, yeah I like done that and it succeeded every time. Hmm, really? really because i mean if we're talking about change i don't i like i have a hard time believing that um so i think if you've got some folks who've who, who've been through the wars go for it on your own because that's really what you're buying i think as a as you know out of a consultant i mean you know i think what ends up happening is 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 there's this impression that there's magic bullet territory happening with consultancies so mm -hmm. like look mckinsey's got a got a 7ps i can't remember what what letter it is but they've got a model for change um and uh you know so they come in and they apply the model so it's like oof, whoa, that was about to be hard but i got mckinsey now and they got a model so now it's easy um so, I mean, if you're thinking that, I think you're, you're, look, McKinsey folks are great. I've worked with lots of them, but you maybe are setting yourself up for some failure. I, I guess if you've got nobody in house, you got to start somewhere and, and starting with a little bit of knowledge can be quite helpful. But I would say if you're reliant on an outsource of your change, you're thinking about it entirely the wrong way because all that stuff is walking out the door with McKinsey or you guys or me or whoever. It doesn't really matter. And that, I think, is maybe, um, you know, a good consulting shop will will make that part of their offering. Like when and, and maybe won't even engage unless that's part of the offering, because, look, at the end of the day, the, you end up if you leave an engagement and, and you left them just as bad, maybe worse than, than they were, you're certainly not going to be talked about in, in a positive light. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you want to leave and help the people in the organization do and be what you were able to do and be? You're going to get talked about more positively because the thing that they wanted to change, state A to state B, they now have the tools and the capabilities and the mindset to kind of keep doing it on their own. 
and do the next one. Right. No, it's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a, a, side, a side fact. Um, I've spoken to enough people where I, they've all told me, and they're like senior people in large enterprises, when they hire companies like McKinsey, Deloitte, PwC, or whatever, when things get fucked up, which, you know, sometimes always, and I have some great examples where it does, it does happen. They, they never, you know, you, what I'm trying to say is that you never get fired if you hired McKinsey or Deloitte. McKinsey. Yes, it's true. You know, like you, you, you hire true. them and it, if shit goes sideways, you're still going to probably keep your job because, well, you know, I hired McKinsey. Like, you know, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to have that figured out for us. But I just like, usually, usually. I think you that's hire, true. A smaller company who's probably better at it and we do bad we're the easy scapegoat you know 100 percent. So. yeah yeah i, I uh, first of all i didn't know i could swear so now now you're in trouble <laughs> yeah, um no so <laughs> um yeah i mean uh, look i i was in a, a transformation uh with a financial services organization and uh, I remember I was I was leaving. I certainly didn't have a good time at, at this organization that they just they, they weren't ready. I wasn't able to get them into the mindset of wanting to be ready, but they wanted the change to have happened already. They were looking at me to just instantly make it happen. And, you know, that doesn't happen. And I, I you know, I I diagrammed out a whole bunch of things like there's a bunch of change curves out there and they all look the same. So Cotter. Um, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Uh, that she was a uh, family uh, family therapy person, and the change looks the same in terms of grief. It's basically like here, then it goes kind of down, and then it comes back up again. So what that means is, is that's time kind of progressing. So what I tend to say is, and there are different names on the curve. It doesn't really matter what they are. The fact of the matter is, and this is like performance. So it's going to get worse before it gets better. My question to these folks is, are you ready? Can you handle that? Because look, you're about to change everything. Like change is typically, you know, some combination of people, process, tools, changing. So if that happens, then how can you expect people to perform exactly the same when you just changed everything on them? That's an unreasonable expectation, yet that expectation exists. So I like to try and prepare the, the folks who are asking for the change to me, I'm like, hey, here's the diagram. Here's all of them. There's like four or five of them out there. They're all, they all look the same. Like, so if you don't think, if you're more of a straight line, tell me why. Like, I, I don't, I'm not saying you can't be. I'm just asking why you. So if I understand why you, then I can kind of coach to that and I can understand that. And yes, maybe, just maybe we can short circuit some, some problems here. But I mean, these curves exist and most people go through it like that. So I, you know, I don't know, get ready. So what ended up happening in this particular instance was no, not ready. Uh, this guy had to report up to the board. And, um, uh, I ended up when I was, when I was out the door, I had to put all, you know, all the different things, decks and stuff that I had created. I had to put them in particular places on, I guess, SharePoint at the time, cause it was that long ago. Um, and, uh, and I found a deck. Uh, that was called something, some executive something or other. I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. I should read that because I'm here, so I have access to it. So I must, they must want me to see this. So click, click, I look at it. And it basically is roasting me as the person who couldn't, you know, make the change. No, no, nothing to do with, with, with the guy who's reading the deck. You know, no, 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 I was the consultant. So, it, I mean, it happens, right? And it, and it's, uh, that's that's okay. You know, it's okay. It's one one of the hazards of the job is getting kind of you know knife marks in the back. <laughs> exactly right. Awesome. A uh, couple more questions, Peter. I wanted to ask you about the yeah. statistical model that you came up with uh, mm. to more accurately predict startup growth. Uh, wanted to ask you what it is and how does it work. Yeah. It. Um, so it's called Estimatic. So E S T. Estimatic, S T E S T I M A T I C. There we go. Whoa, Whew. brain fart. Um, estimatic, and um, it basically what it came from was working with 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 founders, with startup founders, and basically doing you know lean canvases. I would use a lean canvas personally uh, over a business model canvas for new ideas. So it was you know typically new ideas, uh, working with the founder, and you know kind of 
coming up with canvases and getting down to the cost and revenue boxes and having these people go, what are you even talking about? Like at back of the napkin, I can't pay a mortgage on back of the napkin. So I was dealing with mostly kind of older founders, as it turned out. Um, so folks who couldn't live on ramen noodles and on their parents' couch, you know, they had like families, but but had awesome ideas that they wanted to bring to life. So uh, what I ended up doing was starting to do a bunch of research around how do I, um, at the end of the day, how do we get more accurate? So that that's, you know, I'm using that word on purpose. How do we get more accurate about those estimates? So where I landed was, uh, was Monte Carlo analysis. So what that does is it, at the end of the day, instead of saying, you know, typical hockey stick graph, like, you know, here's year one, then year two, then year three, then obviously year four, and then year five, and, you know, you're going to 45x the living daylights out of this. So um, uh, give me a break. Like, I, I don't even know what's going to happen next week, let alone a year from now. So you can't tell me four years from now. So when I was, I was working in, in venture capital, um, and uh, volunteering <laughs> in venture capital, as it turned out, um, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of a lot of pitch decks like that. I'm, I'm sure you have too. You know, and maybe it's not a line. Maybe it's pie graphs, like small pie graph, bigger pie graph, big pie graph. Like it's a hockey stick at the end of the day. So uh, though that irritated me because I I, I I have you know certainly in my personality a uh, uh, distaste for those who claim to be able to predict the future, and that's exactly what that is. So what Estimatic does is it double clicks on kind of points in the future. And instead of saying, I'm going to be exactly a million in revenue in year two, it says there's an 80% chance of being between 400,000 and a million two. There's a 20% chance of being between say 800 and a million. Mm -hmm. it, it allows you to slice and dice um, slice and dice your, your, your data specifically around cost and revenue, but you could do it for anything, user growth, uh, cost savings, it could be anything at the end of the day, uh, but it really provides a visual picture. So it gives you like your, you know, that common bell curve that you're used to seeing and it, and you can slice and dice that data and say, oh, well, what about these two data points? Oh, well, that's like 40% chance. Oh, what about like, you know, no worse than this? Oh, that's like a 20% chance. So it allows you to slice and dice and get ranges for outcomes, or sorry, probabilities associated with ranges of outcomes, which is really accurate. That is what is accurate. Not Accurate is not a point in that particular case. That's completely inaccurate. So that's, um, and, and this is applicable obviously in the startup world, but also in the corporate world, because in the corporate world, we, you know, the, the, they have business cases that do exactly hockey stick, but it's, uh, you know, it's totally, but it's 10 years. So um, it's the exact same thing and it applies in the corporate world as well. No, it's, I, I, I have seen enough pitches myself and decks where nobody, nobody ever provides any very variance or the probability of anything being within a range. Like, I mean, it's as if they, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. It's as if they could all predict the future, right? Going back to those MBA examples, of course. Um, yep. A, a last, I think, last question, maybe another one. I wanted to ask, um, and this question is targeted to a lot of the product people who are going to be listening. But what, what, what would you want to tell them around what they should do to have more product successes in the future? It could be high level. It could be tactical. For both. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things is thinking in, in probabilities, right? Like, so, um, you know, look, one, one of the things that's really useful about thinking that way is you're uh, at the micro level, you're looking at all the aspects of kind of your revenue model. Let's just call it, let's use that because we're talking product. Uh, and you've got a bunch of different variables, cost side, you know, revenue side. Um, and, and sorry, I should say ROI, not revenue. So cost, revenue, and each of these variables has estimates associated with each one of them. And the idea is you, you want to be, you know, 90 to a hundred percent certain. So it depends how you want to run the model, but you want to be, let's say a hundred percent certain in your mind, of course you can't be, but a hundred percent certain as to what this particular variable will be, it, you know, let's say a year in the future, if you're doing this. And if your range is super wide, that means what a great place to go and experiment. 
as opposed to some other variables that might be like the range is really, really tight. Okay, well, maybe you don't need to learn much there. So thinking in terms of, of probabilities allows you to then get even another lens because you're probably already good at, at uh, you know, as a product person at, at, at thinking in terms of like, I got to learn from my customer, but, but like where? Yes, you can come up with your own assumptions and say, oh, this is the riskiest one. But here's another way to validate where the riskiest one is, is taking a look at those variables and seeing where you've got really, really large ranges and then getting curious and saying, oh, I can go experiment there a heck of a lot more. No, I, love I don't it. know if that, did I answer the question? You nailed it, in my opinion. And I think that's <clears throat> what I've seen is the biggest shortfall is that there isn't enough uh, understanding of like the probability side of things in, in product and everything's always a sure thing. Um, <laughs> and you're just basically setting yourself for failure in my opinion with everything you do, yeah. that type of mindset. Um, last question, maybe to depart, uh, to the audience, anything I haven't asked you, uh, what would be your final message wisdom that you want to share with the audience? Hmm. Um, uh, besides how to snow blow your driveway, uh, I just learned that, that like last year, uh, I moved, moved to a place that's like super snowy. I'm like, Hey, what is the best way to snow blow a driveway? There's gotta be a best way. turns out there is, I wasn't doing it the right way. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, anyway, look that up. If you like live in a place that's like super snowy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I really feel like uh, you know, I, I'd want to restate something that we've talked about. You know, there's, there's been a theme running through this whole conversation around uncertainty uh, and around, you know, surrendering to uh, to not having to be right because you can't be right when you talk about the future. You, you, I mean, you could, but you'd be lucky. Um, so it's really how do you, at the end of the day, go step by step into the future and try and mitigate the worst possible things that could happen to you. I mean, it's an experimenter's mindset and it's thinking in terms of if-then statements. So if we do this, then we expect that to happen. Well, how will we know that it's happened? Oh, well, that'll happen. Oh, great, like when, eight years from now or like two weeks from now? Oh, no, 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 within like six months. Okay, cool, there you go, there's your experiment. Let's see what, I, so how would we even try that out? Thinking in that way, um, is, is a, personally, I think a, a mindset that is a requirement to get product right, to get change right. But those are things that are, you know, that are future uncertain. I think anything that is future uncertain, I just don't see how you don't have that, that mindset, um, and, 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 and get as many wins as you should get. No, I think it's fantastic. I, uh, couldn't agree more. Peter, this is awesome. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge with all of us today. Uh, and uh, you know, thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into our show all the time, supporting it, following us on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. We'll be back with another episode. Um, Peter, once again, thank you, thank you. 